I'm excited to be here with you as well. And if you go ahead and take your Bible and turn to uh, Revelation 14, we're going to be in chapters 14 and, and chapter 15. We're going to cover all of that. Before we get started, though, I like the story about a a man who went to visit the doctor, and he just said, uh, you know, my wife, he says, her hearing has just become so poor, he says she just can't hardly hear anything I say anymore. And he says, it's just terrible. It's, even, it's affecting our marriage. It's so bad. And he said, what can I do? And the doctor said, well, what I would do is use the distance test. Uh, what I would do is you, you just speak from different distances to find out how bad it really is. So he said, well, that's a good idea. So he gets home, and um, he, he parks in the garage, walks in the house, and he says, uh, honey, what's for dinner? There's no response. So he walks into the hallway, approaching the kitchen. Again, he says, honey, what's for dinner? And again, there's not any response. And he walks into the edge of the kitchen, and he can see her there kind of slaving over the stove and the sink and that air with her back to him. And he says, honey, what's for dinner? And again, there's no response. So finally, he walks right up behind her. And he says, honey, what's for dinner? And she says, for the fourth time, chicken. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we think we hear better than we do, I guess. But uh, well, anyway, uh, you say, well, what does that have to do with what we're talking about today? Well, the book of Revelation says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. So let's, uh, let's hear this morning what God says to us. Well, a lot of us probably remember uh, some time ago, a few months ago, back in the, in the good old days when you could actually go to a theater and see a movie. <laughs> um, yeah, everybody's on uh, you know, Netflix and Prime Video and all these other things now, but you used to be able to go to a movie theater. I guess that'll uh, happen again someday. But uh, usually before a movie starts, there's about 10 minutes of, of uh, teaser trailers. Um, entertainment marketers uh, strategically use previews of coming attractions to generate buzz and interest for upcoming movies and TV shows. And uh, the, the previews, if you've ever noticed, are usually the best part of the movie, right? They put the best part of the movie in those previews. They're, they're fast-paced, they're loud, uh, they're dramatic. And when we come to Revelation chapter 14 and, and chapter 15, that's really what we have here in these chapters. I like to call this a preview of coming attractions. Because these chapters are a preview or kind of some snapshots of what's coming in the rest of the book. So really above these chapters, if you like to write in your Bible, you could really write the words coming soon. Because these are the events that are going to be coming. So God's preview of the future is found in these verses. And by the way, the fact that God in these uh, chapters previews the future means that God knows the future and that God controls the future and what's coming. God is the writer and the producer and the director of the future and these coming events. So in Revelation 14, we'll look at that first, and then we'll look briefly at the end at chapter 15. But in chapter 14, we have seven previews or seven movie trailers or seven snapshots of major events that are coming in the rest of the book. I, I like to call them vignettes. They're just these brief little vignettes that are kind of previewing what's coming uh, before it happens. And so really in these two chapters, what we have is some more fill-in information. Um, we, we mentioned this last time, but in the book of Revelation, you have uh, the first six seals, and then there's some fill-in information, and you have the seventh seal. And then you have the seventh seal contains the seven trumpets. And you have the first six trumpets that are blown. Between the sixth and seventh trumpet, there's another one of these interludes. And the seventh trumpet is going to contain the seven bowls that will be finally poured out in chapter 16. But chapters 14 and 15 are another one of these interludes where we're getting some more uh, behind-the-scenes information that's filling in here for us. Now, when we come to chapter 14, uh, there's a dramatic change. Um, at the end of chapter 13, everything looks bleak. Uh, you've got the, the beast or the Antichrist. You have uh, the false prophet, the mark of the beast, all of that. But all of a sudden, we come to chapter 14, and there's a major turning of the tide. Let me just give you a few contrasts here to think about. Chapter 13 is dark. Chapter 14, at least at the beginning of it, is light. Chapter 13, you have the beast. Chapter 14, you have the lamb. In chapter 13, you have 666. Chapter 14, you have the 144,000. In chapter 13, you have the Antichrist and then his people. In chapter 14, you have Christ and his people. In chapter 13, you have Satan and Antichrist and the false prophet. In chapter 14, you have God and Christ and the redeemed. In chapter 13, the beast is victorious. In chapter 14, the lamb is victorious. Chapter 13 is the mark of the beast. 
chapter 14, you have the mark of God on the 144,000. And in chapter 13, you have false worship everywhere. Chapter 14, we have true worship everywhere. So it's a turning of the tide, a turning of the page, um, if you will. And so chapter 14 here opens in these vignettes with the 144,000. This is the first of these. We're going to look at seven of them, uh, one right after another. Now, we met the 144,000, you remember, back in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation. 144,000, it's, it's 12,000 Jewish men from each of the 12 tribes um, of Israel. That's who they are. They're 144,000 Jews who will be converted to faith in Jesus Christ as their Messiah after the rapture takes place. And I believe their function is to serve as evangelists or ambassadors for Christ during the tribulation. Remember right after the 144,000 are spoken of in chapter 7, verses 1 to 8, right after that we have a great multitude of Gentiles that no one could number. And I think you have a cause and effect relationship in that chapter. The 144,000 are the cause, the effect are all these Gentiles who are saved. So they're ministering for God, they're sealed by Him, uh, to work for him during that period of time. Now, notice in chapter 14, verse 1, we'll kind of read as we go along. I don't want to read the whole section. It'd take too long. But in chapter 14, verse 1, says, Then I looked, and again, this is after the mark of the beast and the Antichrist has been introduced. Behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and, and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Now, what we see here is 144,000 standing with the lamb on Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion in the Bible, sometimes Mount Zion refers to heaven in passages like in uh, Hebrews chapter 12. But most often, Mount Zion speaks of the literal Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And I think that's the reference here. It's on earth. This is an allusion, I think, back to Psalm 2 that mentions uh, Mount uh, Zion. That, that's the normal meaning of it in Scripture. So what I think this is, again, remember these are previews of coming attractions, this is picturing after the second coming of Jesus, he's returned back to earth at the beginning of the millennial reign, and he's there in glory and victory with these 144,000. And what it, the, the reason this passage is here is to give hope and encouragement that even during those dark days of the Antichrist ruling and reigning, that God is going to ultimately be, be victorious uh, through the 144,000. And so the first thing we see about these 144,000 is they are preserved by God. All the way back in chapter 7, they begin with God's seal on their foreheads, and God says He will protect them. And when we get to the end of the tribulation period here, at the beginning of the millennial reign, Christ has come back. He's standing on Mount Zion as the Lamb. He's there with 144,000. Are there 143,999 of them? No, it's 144,000. He started with 144,000 sealed. We get all the way to the end of the tribulation here, the beginning of this scene of the millennial reign, and there's still 144,000 of them. And it tells us here that God preserves them throughout the tribulation uh, period. Now look, you and I, we're sealed as well. Did you know that? We're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, according to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 4.30 says we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And God finishes what He starts. Uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, I'm confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will perfect it in the day um, of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus say? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give them eternal life. No one can snatch them out of my hand. God's going to preserve us as well if we have faith and trust in the Lamb like the 144,000 do. Another thing we see about the 144,000 is they're purchased. This is powerful. Down at the end of verse 3, the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. They've been purchased by the Lamb. The 144,000 are there on Mount Zion. Notice they're there with the Lamb. Now, this is interesting. In the book of Revelation, there are about 35 different main names and titles for Jesus. But the most common one, 28 times, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb. Only, the, the word's only used one other time about the false prophet who appears like a Lamb. 
But 28 times, more than any other title, Jesus is called uh, the Lamb. And it's interesting to me, in a book that's about the second coming of Christ and about the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the most used title for Jesus is the Lamb because God wants us to never forget that everything we are and everything we have is because of the Lamb um, who paid the full price for our sins there on the cross. So these 144,000, they're purchased uh, by God. They're purchased from the earth. Now, I like this. In the Greek, it's a passive word. And that is that you and I don't purchase ourselves. God purchases us. Believers are those who've been purchased from the slave market of sin by Jesus Christ. We're a purchased people. Uh, We've been bought with a price the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you and I are to triumph in these times in which we live, like the 144,000 will in the future, we have to be purchased. That is the first and foremost thing about any of us. If we haven't been purchased by Christ, nothing else really matters. And the key issue is the price has been paid. The purchase price was paid by Jesus. The question is, have we accepted that purchase price that He uh, gave for us? Have we accepted that pardon that He purchased? Now, the third trait of these uh, 144,000 is they're praising God. Notice verse 2 and 3, I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And again, one of, that's another reason we know this is happening down on earth at Mount Zion in Jerusalem is because he says, I heard a voice from heaven. It's like the sound of many waters, the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who'd been purchased from the earth. So the 144,000 are protected by God through the tribulation. They're purchased by Him, and they're praising and singing a new song. Now think about this. These men, and we'll see this in a moment, they're they're 144,000 Jewish males. They've survived the tribulation. Think about that. They've witnessed millions of martyrdoms. They face the Antichrist. No one has shared the experiences the 144,000 have shared. And it says they sing a new song, and the words aren't recorded here for us, but I believe you and I will hear it someday. We'll hear that song. And they're probably singing about their being purchased by God, and they're being protected by Him throughout that time. And I think it's important for all of us to never get over the wonder of what God has done for us and what He continues to do for us. Some of you probably know the name Gypsy Smith. He was an evangelist back in the last century, a well-known evangelist used greatly by God. And at the end of his life, someone asked him, what is the secret of your spiritual success? And he said, I can say it simply, I never lost the wonder of it all. That's beautiful, isn't it? One of the great secrets to success in the spiritual life is to never get over the wonder of it all, of what God has done for us. Uh, through Jesus Christ. So these men's hearts are filled with praise to God. Another thing about this 144,000 in verse 4 is they're pure. These are the ones who've not been defiled with women. Now, it's not saying that sex is inherently defiling. Obviously, if someone's in a marriage relationship, it's not. So it's not saying it's wrong to have sex or sex is defiling, but these men are single, they're celibate, so for them it would be defiling. These are the ones who've not been defiled with women. So obviously they're males. They've kept themselves chaste. So these 144,000 are pure. They're physically chaste. They're sexually celibate. 144,000 male celibates. Now again, this doesn't mean that there's anything inherently defiling about sex. God's not anti-sex. He created it. Um, Hebrews 13 says the marriage bed is undefiled. Um, read the book, read the Song of Solomon sometime if you think God's against sex. It's a racy book in the Old Testament. But due to the unique times that these men are living in during the tribulation period, it's going to be better for them not to be married, not to have a wife and children. So they'll be totally focused on the Lord and His interests. And they're characterized by separation from the world. And, and let me just say this in our world today, sexual purity is essential to live a triumphant Christian life. Sexual immorality leads to defeat and it leads to guilt and it leads to shame. And we learn here and throughout the Bible that sexual sin is serious business. 
But the problem is you wouldn't know it by looking at our culture today or even by looking at many in the church today. There's all kinds of sexual activity that's on the rise. I mean, pornography has literally just swamped our society. I mean, it's terrible. I look at my sons, and now I have two young grandsons, five years old and one year old. And it's not even a fair fight anymore with all that's out there on the internet. It's a 12 to $15 billion a year industry. We see all that's out there with, with same-sex marriage and homosexuality and adultery and fornication. And tragically, many in the church are in lockstep with the world. Um, I see today among so many people a total disconnect between the way God's calling us to live and how many people are living. Look, there's nothing casual about casual sex. Uh, there's nothing safe about sex outside of marriage. All the abortion and the, uh, the unwed mothers and the diseases and uh, just the, uh, the spiritual toll that it takes on people's lives. Premarital sex, extramarital sex, and unnatural sex or same-sex marriage are forbidden uh, by the Word of God. And you may have a culture that approves, but we don't have a God that approves. And you and I belong to the Lord. We said about the 144,000, they're purchased. We're, we've been purchased by God. We don't belong to ourselves. Isn't that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians? Your body's not your own. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God um, in your body. Our body's not ours to give away. I'm in forbidden uh, sexual pursuit or pleasure. We have an obligation to honor God with our bodies, not to dishonor Him. 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual sin, that you may possess your vessel in sanctification and in honor. Amen. So I know in a group this size, and many people who may be watching, I mean, people that are just literally inundated with pornography in your lives, look, do what you have to do to get away from that. Uh, maybe if it's spending time on your computer alone that tempts you to do that, get away from that. Maybe it's staying up late at night. You need to change your habits. What did Jesus say? If your right hand offends you, cut it off. I mean, what He's saying is take radical steps. Some of you may have channels. You need to get off of your television. All kinds of things. Whatever radical steps need to be taken to take it. Now, of course, there's forgiveness and restoration from sexual sin. There is from all sin. But oftentimes the damage is still done. But if, if you fail, receive God's forgiveness and determine from this point on to pursue purity um, in your heart and in your life. So the, these 144,000, they're pure. And because of that, they're powerful and God can use them. I think it was said, what, what is of Sir Galahad? His, his strength was as the strength of 10 because his heart was pure. There's a purity and there, there's a power that comes from purity. Well, the final thing here about these 144,000, this is my favorite thing about them. Notice it says um, down in, in verse 4, these are the ones, in the middle of the verse, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. It's in the present tense in Greek, which means the 144,000, they keep on following the Lamb wherever He goes. Now, what did Jesus say in the Gospels? Follow me. That's what it means to be a Christian, to follow Jesus. We follow a person because Jesus is the lamb, but he's also the shepherd. And the 144,000 willingly do what the Lord asks him to do, that they're at his disposal. Like I was reading about a man not long ago, and he said every morning before he gets out of bed, he's lying there in bed, and he says, Lord, this bed is the altar, and I'm the sacrifice. Every morning before he gets up to leave. To, to follow the lamb, to follow him through thick or thin. It's a story about an old explorer years ago and he was in the depths of a jungle and he met a man there and he was trying to find a way to get to his destination. And he said, uh, do you have a map or, or something like that that will show me the way? And the guide looked at him and said, I'm the way. Uh, that's the way Jesus is. He's the way. He's the one who leads us and we are to pursue him and follow him wherever he goes, wherever he leads us. Well, that's this 144,000. This is this initial preview of a coming attraction where we see the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion with Jesus after His second coming at the beginning of the millennium. And again, after the dark chapter in chapter 13, it's there to give encouragement and hope that God is going to see His people uh, through ultimately to the end. Now, verse 6 and 7, we come to the second one of these previews of coming attractions. And I call this the, the declaration of the gospel. 
And I saw another angel flying in midheaven, having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. This is one of God's final acts of mercy during the tribulation period. It's a final opportunity for people to repent. It's like a last call uh, for repentance. And uh, this is a saving message here that goes out. Revelation, if you read the book, has a lot of bad news in it, doesn't it? There's a lot of bad things that are coming, but this is good news. And this angel is flying in mid-heaven with a loud voice so all can see, proclaiming the eternal gospel. Now what's interesting, this is the only time in Revelation you find the word gospel. And this is the last time. It's the only time, and it's the last time in the Bible. And so this is a final call to repentance as actually an angel is flying, giving the eternal message for people to fear God and to turn to Jesus Christ. And I think what we see here is, you remember in Matthew 24, 14, it says this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in the whole world for a witness and then the end will come. And it's showing here the Antichrist cannot keep the gospel from being proclaimed. God can have the gospel proclaimed from an angel flying um, in midheaven. So this is like a, a final call to repentance uh, to the world. Then we come to verse 8 and we come to the third snapshot of the future, the destruction of Babylon. Another angel, a second one followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all the na- nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Um, if I were to ask you here this morning, some of you that know a decent amount about the book of Revelation, what topic in Revelation receives more uh, press, uh, more words than any other topic? It's actually the topic of Babylon. You have Babylon mentioned here, Babylon's mentioned at the end of chapter 16, and then you have two long chapters that uh, Dr. Woods is going to speak on this afternoon, Revelation 17 and 18. So in the book of Revelation, there's 404 verses, and 44 of the 404 verses are about Babylon. So 11% of the book is about Babylon. So whatever Babylon is, it's very, very important to God. And what we have here again in this passage, again, these previews, this is a preview of what's going to happen. And by the way, it's not recorded until Revelation 17 and 18, but it's stated here as a done deal before we even get to it in the future. In other words, this evil city of the end times and its evil system is going to fall. So again, it's just a preview um, of what's coming. Now the fourth one of these little vignettes is in verses 9 through 11. And we could call this the doom of the defectors or the doom of hell. Notice he says in verse 9, another angel, a third one, followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, and he will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now listen to this. This is sobering. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives of the mark of his name. Now this relates to the future time of the tribulation, but it also teaches us timeless truths about hell. Now hell's never been a popular topic, but it's probably less popular today than it's ever been. But I like what one man says. He says, to speak of hell is precarious, but not to speak of hell is more precarious. And we see that in our country today and in our world. Uh, Vance Havner was an old uh, Baptist preacher from years ago, and he pastored a country church early in his ministry. And once when he preached about hell, an old farmer confronted him after the message and said, why don't you just preach about the meek and lowly Jesus? And Havner responded, that's where I got my information about hell. (laughs) Because Jesus tells us more about it than anybody else. He spoke more about it than anyone else. And Jesus Himself spoke of hell as real and awful and eternal. The place where the the fire is not quenched, where the worm doesn't die. I mean, Jesus was graphic in what He he says about it. 
Now, as you can imagine, when we think about hell and the, the fact that it's repugnant to our natural mind, people have come up with different alternatives. Uh, one that's out there that's growing, I think, in, in, uh, in uh, professing Christian circles is universalism. And universalism basically teaches that every human being will finally come to eternal salvation. In other words, uh, no one will ultimately be consigned to hell. That's this idea of universalism. It's universal. Everybody's going to get saved. And that's appealing to a lot of people today. Uh, Rob Bell, some of you know that name, in his book, Love Wins, he says this, there is inclusivity, the kind that is open to all religions, the kind that trusts that good people will get in, that there is only one mountain, but it has many paths. This inclusivity assumes that as long as your heart is fine and your actions measure up, you'll be okay. Now, I could take that apart. There's a lot of problems with what's said right there. But let me just say this. Is that what Jesus said in the Bible? No. No, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Amen. Um, a passage that's very sobering in Matthew 7, 13, Jesus said, narrow is the gate. Narrow is the path that leads to life. Few there be that find it. Broad is the gate. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. Many there will be who find it. There's a narrow gate and a narrow path. And that narrow gate and narrow path is the way of Christ. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says, there's salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And the pluralism and the universalism today that says you can believe what you want, all paths lead to heaven, it's apostasy. There's no other word for it. And the rush and the swelling of apostasy that we see is actually another sign of the times uh, that Jesus' coming is near because uh, Paul tells us evil men and seducers will grow worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. So it's tragic. Those who hold these wrong doctrines about eternity actually are speeding the coming of Christ. I'm going to just mention a couple of others here. Um, some people believe in annihilationism. They say, look, the lost are going to be resurrected and judged, but they'll just be annihilated or destroyed by God. They'll be annihilated at, at that point in time, and they won't spend eternity separated from God. There's a lot of problems with that view, but here's one of them. The Bible says there's going to be degrees of punishment in the afterlife. Well, how can you have degrees of annihilation? I mean, you either get annihilated or you don't, right? I mean, you can't get annihilated worse. The Bible says, you know, some will be beaten with few stripes, some with many stripes. It's going to be better in the judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for Capernaum and, and for uh, Bethsaida and for Chorazin. So the idea that we're going to be annihilated is contrary to Scripture. Every one of us will live for eternity somewhere. We can't avoid that. You say, well, I don't want to live for eternity somewhere. Well, I'm sorry, you're going to. I mean, it's the way God has made us. Other people believe in what's called conditionalism or conditional immortality. And they say that what's going to happen is people are going to be judged and they'll live for varying degrees, but then they'll be snuffed out at different points of time. So, so for them, eternal destruction means people will be destroyed forever, but they'll be annihilated at different points of time along the way. But Someone has put it like this. I like this statement. Universalists seek to take the forever out of hell. Conditionalists try to take the hell out of forever. But both of those views, are, all those views are wrong. The view that the Bible teaches is exclusivism, or what we might call eternalism. And that is only those who trust in the gospel go to heaven, while the unbelieving are consigned to hell forever. And in this passage here, he's telling us those who take the mark of the beast during the tribulation will be sent to hell forever. You think about this, in the tribulation period, it's going to be a unique time, unlike any other time. People are going to have a stark choice. It's going to be Christ or it's going to be Antichrist. It's going to be take the mark or it's going to be refuse the mark. And he says those who knowingly take the mark of the beast they're going to be tormented um, in hell forever. Now, let me just say a couple things about the mark of the beast. Uh, the mark of the beast is not a social security card or it's not, uh, uh, you know, something else that we see today. The mark of the beast is going to be brought about by the Antichrist and the false prophet during the last half of the tribulation period. And it's going to be a mark of loyalty and allegiance to the Antichrist. In fact, when you take that mark, you're going to literally be taking the number of his name upon you. 
The numerical value of the Antichrist name will be 666. People are going to be swearing allegiance and pledging their allegiance to the Antichrist. So let me just say this. Nothing today is the mark of the beast. To, to try to make something today the mark of the beast is jumping the gun. We're not in the tribulation period yet. And let me also say this. Those who take the mark during the tribulation will take it knowingly. In other words, God's not going to send somebody for, to hell for taking something um, against their will or unknowingly. So, you know, people will write me and say, you know, could this thing be the mark of the beast or that? Um, look, I tell them, you're not going to take the mark of the beast accidentally. It's going to be something that people do and pledge their allegiance to the Antichrist. And it says here, those who do that are going to drink of the wine of the wrath of God, mixed in full strength in the cup of His anger, be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Look, death is not a period, it's a conjunction. Remember in uh, Luke 16, it says, Lazarus died and the rich man died and... Death is not a period, it's a conjunction. When you die, you go somewhere. And lost people go to Hades now, where their soul is kept, until someday it'll be brought before the great white throne, and then will be cast ultimately into the lake of fire. But it says in Luke 16, the rich man is tormented there in, in Hades. And in chapter 14, verse 10, it says, be tormented with fire and brimstone. And it says... Uh, up in, uh, let's see, it says it's going to be forever and ever. Yeah, in verse 11. Smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. That is an expression in the Greek that is the strongest expression that you can give for something being eternal. Um, in fact, it's used 11 times in Revelation. It's used of the eternal existence of God. It's used of Christ. It's used of Christ's eternal reign uh, with believers. It's used of Satan's eternal doom. So it's a word that means forever. And lost people in hell will suffer the undiluted wrath of God with torment before God and the angels, and it's going to be forever. The people deny that today, and the reason people deny it is they claim to be wiser than God. They claim to know better than God what should happen. But you and I need to humbly submit ourselves to God and trust in Christ and praise God from the bottom of our hearts that He saved us, and we're not going to end up there someday and to tell others as well so they can join us in heaven. Uh, look, the, the price of sin has to be paid. God can't just wink at sin. God's holy. God's justice has to be satisfied. And Jesus drank the whole cup of God's fury against sin, and we either receive the payment that He paid for our sins, or we have to pay for it forever. But the price has got to be paid. We either pay for it ourselves, or we accept the payment that Christ made for us. When I was at the Dallas Seminary, my favorite professor there was Dr. Stanley Toussaint. And he tells a story when he was there, the founder of the seminary was a man named Louis Sperry Chafer. And when Dr. Chafer was around 80 years of age, he was getting older then and fairly feeble. And at one time they'd had a, a lecture in theology the day before about the doctrine of propitiation. Now that's a big word, but it's a great word. And the word propitiation means that through the death of Jesus, that God's wrath has been placated and appeased and satisfied. Amen. And he preached on that the last class or taught on that. And uh, Dr. Toussaint said that uh, the next morning, Dr. Chafer walked in and laid his Bible there. And it was all men in the class at that time. He looked out at the men and he said, men, God is satisfied. Men, God is satisfied. Men, God is satisfied. Never forgotten that story. God is satisfied. He's not satisfied with me, but He's satisfied with what His Son, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, has done. And what a great thing to get up every day and to know that God is satisfied with what Christ has done. And that if I'm in Him, that I have life. And I'm not going to have to face uh, this horrible picture that's given to us here in this passage. Well, the opposite is given to us now in verse 12 and 13. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. It's faith in Jesus. That's the key. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. This is the death of the saints or the delight of heaven. Again, this passage is in contrast uh, to what we've seen before. And again, to put it in its context, he's saying, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. It's talking about during the tribulation period. Blessed are those who die. People are going to be martyred during that time. 
And he's saying they're blessed uh, when they die. But notice he says, blessed are those who die in the Lord. It's only dying in the Lord. The only blessing in death is to die in the Lord, to have a relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. And he says it's a blessing. It's happy. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but for a believer in Jesus Christ, the worst thing that can happen to us is the best thing that can happen to us. The worst thing that can happen to us, death, is actually the best thing that can happen to us. We're rejoicing. He says, blessed are those who die in the Lord. And he says that they may rest from their labors. It doesn't mean that uh, you know, we're going to go to heaven and just be spiritual couch potatoes you know, for, for eternity, sitting around on a cloud you know, strumming a harp. But it refers to the cessation of difficulties associated with this life. Think about that. The sins that beset us in this life are gone. Physical ailments, gone. Strife in our relationships, gone. Misunderstandings, gone. Financial stress, gone. In other words, we're going to lay our burdens down. And we're going to be able to rest there with the Lord. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And then the final thing he mentions here is reward. And their deeds will follow with them. Their deeds will follow with them. Someday you and I are going to stand before the Lord. We're going to sing solo before God. Uh, We're going to be held accountable for what we've done in this life. And he says our deeds are going to follow us. I like old J. Vernon McGee put it like this. God doesn't save anyone for his works, but he does reward us for our works. Our works, good or bad, I like this, are like tin cans tied to a dog's tail. We cannot get away from them. They will follow us to the judgment seat of Christ. That old dog, he'd like to get rid of those tin cans tied to his tail, but it says their deeds will follow after them. Well, the next vignette here, the sixth one of these vignettes here, now comes to a very negative scene here of judgment. Verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, a lot of people take this to be Jesus because he's like a son of man, and that refers back to Revelation 1, ultimately back to Daniel 7. But notice verse 15 says, Another angel came down out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap. I don't think this angel sitting on a cloud in verse 14 is Jesus, because if it is, that means an angel in verse 15 is telling Jesus what to do. And so I think these are both angels here. It's just a picture of a a, a powerful angelic being. What we have here in this last section we'll look at in chapter 14 is two harvests. We have a grain harvest and a grape harvest, but it speaks of coming judgment. And in verses 14 to 16, we have the day of the harvest. And in verses 17 to 20, we have what I call the devastation of Armageddon. The earth is getting ready to be reaped. Now, I I like what someone I, I read years ago said, the angels here in this passage now move from heralding to harvesting. They're moving from heralding to harvesting. And what's happening here is the world is ripe for judgment. He says, put in your sickle, the end of verse 15, and reap, for the hour to reap has come, the harvest of the earth is ripe. And that word literally means dry, like grain that's dry and ready uh, to be harvested. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth uh, was reaped. Look, Jesus came the first time as a sower. He's coming the second time as a reaper. And it's our job now to continue to sow, to sow the Word of God. But He's coming back uh, to reap. Now, I think in verses 14 to 16, this is a preview of coming attractions. I think this is a preview of the bowl judgments in chapter 16. When God is going to reap the earth, and He's going to begin to bring His judgment upon the earth. But we move from a grain harvest into a grape harvest. Verse 17, another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. Which, by the way, I mentioned this last night. God sits on a throne in a temple in heaven. The temple on earth, remember, was built after the prototype. So God's in a temple in heaven. And he had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came from the altar and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. Now that's a different word that means fully ripe. It's like bursting with juice. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the winepress of the wrath of God. 
And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridle for a distance of 200 miles." Now, this is an appalling, gruesome scene that pictures the severity of God's judgment. And what this is, it's a preview of the campaign of Armageddon. It's going to be mentioned in Revelation 16, 16. It's going to be mentioned in Revelation 19 when Christ come back to destroy the Antichrist and His his, uh, armies that are gathered there. But this is the first mention of it. Now, some have called this passage the grapes of wrath, and that's certainly a graphic picture of what's happening here. But it's a preview of the campaign of Armageddon that will be in the valley of Megiddo there in northern Israel. I know many of you have been there. Uh, my wife and I led a tour group to Israel in March, and uh, we, we went in uh, late February. We went a few days early, and the day we were coming back was uh, March the 13th, right as all this COVID stuff was going crazy, and they'd closed travel from Europe. And it was an interesting time to be in Israel because the streets of Jerusalem were empty. It was, it was eerie, and it was, it was quite a, a, a process getting everybody back home. But we had visited while we were there Armageddon, the site there of the Valley of Armageddon that's 20 miles long and 14 miles wide. When I got back, I was reading on the internet and uh, someone had a, an article there kind of pointing out some irony. They said, Armageddon is now closed. <laughs> you know, tour groups can't go there. And I thought, yeah, that's pretty interesting. You know, when Armageddon's closed, if things are pretty bad, I guess, when that happens. But uh, we know that ultimately Armageddon's not going to be closed. Christ is going to come there. And the, the, the whole campaign of of Armageddon is not just going to happen there at Armageddon. It's going to span the entire length of the land of Israel. Notice it's 200 miles. Now it talks about blood coming up from the wine press to the horse's bridle. Now when I was a little boy, I would hear preachers come and talk about prophecy, and they would talk about Armageddon, and they would say that the blood is going to flow 200 miles as deep as the bridle of a horse. Now, I wasn't the smartest kid in the world, but I thought, man, you know, that's a lot of blood. I mean, I don't know how much blood's in one body, but I mean, you know, it's a, it's a lot of blood, and you think it would kind of be going down, you know, if it's just for that area, it would constantly be running off somewhere. And a lot of people take this literally. I take it literally, but I think there's a symbol underneath it, and the picture here is a wine press being trodden. If you know anything about wine presses in that day, there was a large uh, stone cylinder that had a, an area on top where the grapes would be placed, and people would get in there and stomp the, stomp the grapes. And then there would be a spout where the juice would go out and go down into an area where it was collected. And I think the picture here is, is Jesus is going to come and tread the wine press of the fierce wrath of God. And it's saying here, the blood will come out from the wine press up to the horse's bridle. It doesn't say it's going to flow that deep, it's going to come up that high. And the picture is of someone in a wine press, and wine presses again are usually about, I don't know, a couple feet high. Someone stomping the grapes with such severity that it'll squirt the juice all the way up to the bridle of a horse. In other words, up probably another two or three feet. And the point is, that's some pretty severe stomping to bring that to pass, right? So it's a picture of juice, like blood, squirting up to the horse's bridle out of a wine press. For a distance of 200 miles, it'll engulf the entire land of Israel, the campaign of Armageddon that will take place when Jesus returns. If you go over to Revelation 19, uh, Revelation 19 and verse 20, this is kind of the culmination of Armageddon, or verse 19. Saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. The beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who'd received the mark of the beast and those who'd worshipped his image. They were thrown alive in the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And the birds were filled with their flesh. The sword out of Jesus' mouth speaks of his word. And I remember years ago at Dallas Seminary in a class on Revelation with Dr. Dwight Pentecost. And uh, he'd sit up there kind of with his arms crossed, with his coat and tie on, kind of hunk- hunkered down behind his uh, lectern. And he said, all Jesus is going to have to do when he comes back is just say, drop dead. That's going to all be over. <laughs> I mean, it's really not going to be a battle at all, the campaign of Armageddon. Jesus will come back. And it says in, in 2 Thessalonians, he's going to slay the Antichrist uh, with the breath of his mouth. 
But this picture here is a picture of severity. But remember, God is merciful and God is patient. And He's waiting. And notice He's not going to come until it's ripe. Until everything's ripe. And this world is ripening that we live in, isn't it? It's ripening for judgment. So you and I need to be aware of that and we need to be urgent in our own lives in the way we're living and what we're doing and how we're living for Christ. Well, let me close here in chapter 15. This is the shortest chapter in the book of Revelation. I, I call this the temple of doom and the seven bowls. Just kind of a, a little bit of housekeeping here again. If you think about the book of Revelation, you have the seals and then the trumpets and then the bowl judgments. But with each of those, there's a scene in heaven before the judgments are unleashed. In chapter 4 and 5, we go to heaven and have a celestial scene. And then you have the, the seals. Chapter 8, we go back to heaven again and, and see God's throne. And then the trumpets are unleashed. And chapter 16 is going to be the pouring out of the bowl judgments. Chapter 15, we go to heaven again for a, a celestial interlude, if you will. And what that's telling us in the book of Revelation, and you might write this down, this is a great thought. The book of Revelation has an alternating pattern where it ping-pongs back and forth from heaven to earth. A scene in earth, a heaven, a scene on earth. In heaven and earth, it goes back and forth. And the purpose of that is to show us that what is happening on earth is being controlled from God's throne in heaven. Um, heaven has an occupied throne, and God is in control of, of what's happening uh, here on this earth. Our God reigns, and that's the point here. Notice in verse, chapter 15, verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had seven plagues, who are the last, which are the last. So this is going to bring us to the end, these seven bowls, because in them the wrath of God um, is finished. But God is reigning and in control. A lot of you probably heard this whole story before. Ray Steadman, he was a well-known pastor in uh, Palo Alto years ago. But he was in California, uh, in uh, England some years ago. And that's when that song had come out, the chorus, um, Our God Reigns. You know that song, Our God Reigns? And um, he stood up and it, it, they started to sing and it sounded funny to him, everybody singing it. And so he looked down and the person who had uh, printed the lyrics for everybody to sing had had to put a typo in there and actually said, our God resigns instead of our God reigns. So everybody's singing, our God resigns. And um, I think about that because a lot of people live today as if God has resigned. Uh, but God hasn't resigned, He reigns. He, he's on His throne in heaven. He's seated in that temple. And these angels are coming there to Him to receive these final plagues uh, to pour out on the earth. Now just a couple of thoughts here as we, as we draw this to a close. Verse 2, I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those who'd been victorious over the beast in His image and the number of His name standing on a sea of glass holding harps of God. We don't normally think about people who've been killed and martyred as being victorious, but they are. Remember years ago... Uh, seeing those Coptic Christians out there on a beach and ISIS beheading them there. You remember that scene? And I remember this passage. Those who had come off victorious over the beast, they were actually the ones who were victorious, um, being martyred for their faith um, in Jesus Christ. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God. And I think that's Exodus 15 the song of Moses there, because so much of what we have in this chapter alludes back to the Exodus. We'll talk about that in just a minute, but so much of this alludes back to the Exodus. These plagues that are being poured out, seven plagues, are reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt. So they sang the song of Moses, chapter 15 of Exodus, and the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And this is the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, O God, the Almighty. Righteous and true your ways. King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. This is the song of the Lamb. Again, the most frequent title for Jesus in the book of Revelation. You can actually summarize the whole Bible with the idea of Jesus being the Lamb. Back in Genesis 22, the question was asked by Isaac to his father Abraham, Father, where is the Lamb? In John chapter 1, John the Baptist looks at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We get to the book of Revelation at the end, it's worthy as the Lamb. It's where the whole Bible, where's the Lamb? Behold the Lamb, and worthy um, is the Lamb who's coming to rule and to reign. After these things I looked, verse 5, the temple of the tabernacle of testimony was opened. 
Seven angels who had the seven plagues came out of the temple clothed in linen, clean and bright, that girded around their chests with golden sashes. Then one of the living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke. I call this holy smoke. From the glory of God and from His power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels uh, were finished. Now this whole scene here, well, I'd like to develop this more, but I'll do it quickly. This whole scene here is Exodus imagery. Back in the book of Exodus, it's God's great act of deliverance and redemption of His people. What we have here is the last Exodus, if you will. And I've got a slide there that has a lot of these similarities. I'll just mention these. But in the Exodus, you have the Passover lamb. Here in these chapters, you have the Lamb of God. You notice how much Jesus has been called the Lamb? It says that the... the uh, 144,000 are standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. It says they're pursuing the Lamb. We get to chapter 15. It says they're singing the song of the Lamb. It's all about the Lamb. In Exodus, you had Pharaoh, who was the enemy of God's people. In the, in the book of Revelation, you have the Antichrist. Back in Exodus, you had the ten plagues. In Revelation, you have the seven plagues. In Exodus, you had the Red Sea. Here you have the Crystal Sea before God. In Exodus, you had God bringing His people out. In Revelation, He's bringing His people in. In Exodus, you have the song of Moses. In Exodus 15, the first song in the Bible. Here you have the song of Moses and the Lamb, which is the final song. Back there, you have the tabernacle. Here you have God's temple in heaven. There you have the smoke at Mount Sinai. In Revelation 15, you have the smoke of heaven. So it's this whole picture of, of the Exodus that's taking place. I uh, wasn't going to tell this story. I don't have time, but I'll tell it real quickly. There was a little boy one time. He was sitting on a park bench. And um, he was saying, praise God, hallelujah. And this older man walked by and said, what in the world are you talking about? And the little boy said, well, I just read in the Bible about God leading His people through the Red Sea and delivering them in the Exodus. And this old man uh, turned to him and he said, son, he says, let me, let me enlighten you about this. He says, you know... Um, uh, back in those days, he, and by the way, the boy says, you know, God uh, opened the Red Sea and he, and, he, and he brought it back on the Egyptians and drowned them. I mean, it was God's great deliverance. And this old man comes by and he says, son, let me, let me help you out with this and enlighten you a little bit. You know, there was, this wasn't really the Red Sea. It was called the Reed Sea. And it was just 10 inches deep of water and the children of Israel walked across. I mean, it was, it was no miracle uh, really at all. And so the little boy sat there thinking for a minute and the man walked away. And suddenly the little boy said, praise God, hallelujah, and starts ho hollering out again. The man says, what is it now? And the little boy said, well, God's greater than I thought. Not only did He lead the whole nation of Israel through the Red Sea, He topped it off by drowning the whole Egyptian army in 10 inches of water. <laughs> it's pretty good. But, but here we have in Revelation, it's, it's alluding all the way back to the, to the Exodus, to the Red Sea. And what happened with Pharaoh and the plagues? Now it's Antichrist, and God's bringing these plagues again. So there's the first exodus, and there's going to be this final exodus someday. But you and I live in between the first exodus and the final exodus. But it's still the same message today. It's our relationship to the Lamb that determines our destiny. Back with the first exodus, it was the relationship to the Lamb that determined the destiny. It's going to be the same thing in the book of Revelation. And it's the same thing for us today. And really, if you look at chapters 14 and 15, the Lamb kind of bookends uh, this whole section for us. It's all about uh, the Lamb, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a, a church over in Germany. Um, it's an old Catholic church. And there's a card figure of a lamb near the church's tower. And the story behind that is the men were building this tower. And one of the men who was up there lost his balance and he fell. And uh, when he falls down, uh, his friends go down there expecting him to find him dead there on the ground. He fell from a great height. But they go down there and they find out that um, a shepherd had been leading his sheep down the street when the man fell. And he actually fell down and landed on a lamb and crushed that lamb and killed it. But it broke his fall and saved his life. The lamb broke his fall and was crushed, but the man uh, was saved. And Jesus Christ did the same thing for us as the Lamb of God. He broke our fall. I mean, He took our sin. He took our death and our judgment. The Lamb of God was crushed so that we could be saved. And that's the good news of the gospel um, of Jesus Christ. 
Most of you have heard that old song before. I, I got saved as a young boy, five years of age, watching Billy Graham on television. Remember, he'd always close uh, those crusades that he had that he called them in those days with that great song, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Jesus is coming back for those who've come to him. That's who he's coming back for. And make sure you've come to him. You've come to Jesus Christ, the Lamb who gave himself for you. And if you've never done that, why not come to him right now as we pray together?